Thank you. Thank you. So we got a uh, thank you. Thank you for joining me on this episode of Major Guests. Uh, today, our guest is Pluto. And uh, we're, I'm still kind of workshopping the name a little bit. Uh, I might just have every episode Major Guests. I don't know. It's a work in progress. But I get pretty much so much, you know, kind of time each month to make recordings. And I was otherwise busy this month or busier than normal during November. And uh, so I didn't really have as much time to put out as many episodes as I did, like, say, in October. And because of that, my time pretty much renews on the first of every month or the 30th of every month rather. And my, I still have like three hours left for this month. <laughs> so this, this might be a long episode since it pretty much, uh, it resets in about, I want to say 11 hours from now. So <laughs> I might as well just get the time out of it because it doesn't roll over. So if this is a long episode, I, you know, You'll just have to work with me there. But I did actually spend quite a lot of time on this episode, just in the like the pre uh, like research stage of every episode that I go through. And I mean, with this one, there's there's quite a bit to go over. So it it took a little bit of time. Um, and today on this episode of Major Guests, we're going to talk about space, outer space. Woo! And there's there's so much about space, our solar system, and the galaxy that we still don't know. Uh, space is vast with billions of galaxies and stars and planets in our own solar system yet to really be fully explored or understood. And scientists' knowledge of space is always evolving because of this. There are, however, some really cool things we do already know. And with us today is Pluto, a silent observer who's been there from the beginning, minus about 50 million years um, from Earth. But, I mean, not not really much happened in those 50 million years anyway, so... But yeah, without further ado, let's introduce Pluto. Hey, thank you for having me out. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Now it's a long trip for you. Yeah, a little bit. So today we wanted to talk about, uh, you know, just covering like our solar system, some outer space anomalies, some black holes, dimensions, and some space sounds. And since you've been there for, I mean, you've seen all of, like, pretty much all of Earth's history mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. space and everything that we know of, you probably have a better idea of, you know, different things that we can learn from you. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, since uh, we'll just kick it right off, uh, we'll jump right into the sounds of space. Uh, so space, you know, it's it's completely silent. There's there's no atmosphere in space, which means that sound really has no medium or way to travel to be heard, by your ears at least. Uh, however, there are kind of known to be some pockets of charged particles trapped within radio waves, which have been taken by astronomers and converted into sounds. And kind of cosmologists generally pick these signals up with radio meters but they also look for like distant signals in the universe using a complex instrument fixed to this big balloon that was like sent into space uh, the instrument kind of was able to pick up different radio waves from the heat of distant stars but what came through was actually something they weren't expecting like as the so since the instrument listened from like a height of like 23 miles it picked up a signal that was about six times louder than they expected um because it was too loud to be like 
early stars and far greater than the predicted combined radio emission from distant galaxies. The powerful signal caused a ton of confusion with all the cosmologists and everything, and scientists still don't know what's causing it, like even today. What's more, it could kind of slow the efforts to search for other signals from the first stars that were formed after the Big Bang. So the instrument that detected the this mysterious roaring signal was the absolute radio meter for cosmology, astrophysics, and diffuse emissions, and or arcade for short, uh, which NASA kind of built to extend the study of cosmic microwave background spectrum at lower frequencies. So once... Humans began collecting gravitational data for the first time, like a large, unusual signal was spotted, and it surprised everyone because it would have carried so much energy in just a short 200 millisecond burst that it would have outshone all the stars in the observable universe combined, and the energy from that burst came from two black holes, actually. Um, of 36 and 29 solar masses merging into one single 62 solar mass one. But the the math doesn't really add up there because there's about three missing solar masses-ish, and they were converted into pure energy. So like gravitational waves rippling through the fabric of space. And that was the first event that LIGO, or the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, ever detected. So we have like LIGO and Arcade. Um, but this was the most powerful event ever detected since the Big Bang. And that's only technically true because of the limits of the detection. So when they're are any black hole mergers like approximately 10% of the mass of the least massive or lesser massive black hole in the merger pair gets converted into pure energy via the that's how you get the Einstein's e equals mc squared so, I mean 20 and and for this case the one that you guys actually heard with the, the 36 and 29 solar masses merging that, uh, I mean, 29 solar masses is a lot, but there are going to be black holes of hundreds of millions or even billions of solar masses that have merged together. So, the, I mean, and the, the biggest one that was heard so far was just 29 and 36. So like, no, it's not anything um, compared to, you know, like billions. So... Uh, not and not only have other black hole to black hole mergers been detected, but the future of gravitational wave astronomy is pretty pretty bright as kind of new detectors will open up your ears to new types of sounds. So like space interferometers like LISA or LIGO or any of them will have longer bass lines, and we'll hear lower frequency sounds, sounds like neutron star mergers, uh, like feasting supermassive black holes, and their mergers, and highly unequal masses, just loud solar gravitational anomalies. Uh, pulsar timing arrays can measure even lower frequencies than any of those. Uh, like orbits that take years to complete, like the supermassive black hole pair OJ-287, uh, and combinations of kind of new techniques will look for the oldest gravitational waves of all, um, the relic waves predicted by cosmic inflation all the way back to the beginning of our universe. And there are many 
many more gravitational wave signals other than what the LIGO and LISA and Arcade have seen so far. And they've only detected the easiest signal there is to detect so far. That's just like all of that previous stuff that there's all this big stuff that they've heard and the black hole merging and stuff. That's that's just the easiest signal there is to detect in space converted into sound. It's like nothing. But since we're on the topic of black holes, we'll just we'll dive into kind of the anomalies of outer space since the sound one was kind of complicated and weird. Um, so what is a black hole? Just so we're all on the same page, uh, a black hole is a place in space where gravity per- pulls so much that even light cannot get out. The gravity is so strong because matter has been squeezed into a tiny space. This can happen when like a star is dying, like a, like the sun or something. So because no light can get out, people can't see black holes. They're pretty much invisible. But space telescopes with special tools can help find black holes. The special tools can see how stars that are like very close to black holes act differently than other stars. Um, the, and black holes can be big or small. Scientists think that the smallest black holes are as small as just one atom. And these black holes are very tiny, but have the mass of a large mountain because it's just mass compressed all the way down. Like it's, small as possible so a one atom black hole could have as much mass as a mountain Um, it's like that's just like the amount of matter stuff in an object Uh, another kind of black hole is called stellar and its mass can be up to 20 times more than the mass of the sun Uh, (laughs) there may be many, many stellar mass black holes in Earth's galaxy, and which is called the Milky Way. That's where we're all at. Um, so the largest black holes are called supermassive, and these black holes have masses that are more than one million suns put together. And scientists have found proof that every large galaxy contains a supermassive black hole at its center. And the supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way galaxy is called Sagittarius A. It has a mass equal to about 4 million suns and would fit inside a very large ball that could hold a few million Earths. So it's, it's pretty big. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, scientists think the smallest black holes formed when the universe began because they were kind of the easiest to form. But then the stellar black holes are made when the center of a very big star falls in on itself or collapses. When this happens, it causes a supernova, which is like uh, an exploding star that blasts part of the star into space. So when the supernova happens, the star is kind of falling in on itself and it creates this event. But now supermassive black holes, scientists believe, were made at the same time as the galaxy they are in. But since black holes are black and space is black, how do people see them? I mean, it's easy for me to say I've been out there for... Four billion years, so. But, you know, to the untrained eye, a black hole can't be seen because strong gravity pulls all the light into the middle of the black hole. But scientists can see how the strong gravity affects the stars and gas around the black hole, kind of watching it kind of orbit and flying around which the stars normally wouldn't do. So when a black hole and a star are close together, like high-energy light is made, 
and this kind of light can't be seen with human eyes, so I wouldn't worry about it. Uh, but scientists can use satellites and telescopes in space to see this high energy light. Um, and really about one in a thousand stars will ever become a black hole. And there are you know, roughly over 400 stars within 30 light years of, uh, of the Milky Way. Um, and zero of them are class O or B stars, which are the two biggest and brightest. And zero of those 400 have become black holes because the only ones that would would be O or B stars. But think about it as simply a region of empty space with strong gravitational properties. In fact, if if all you did was assign mass to this region of space, that would perfectly define a Schwarzschild non-charged, non-rotating black hole. But now, if you were to fall into a black hole, we'll say it's the size of the sun. Uh, you'd have about a microsecond from crossing the event horizon until you were crushed to death at the singularity. And with a little bit of math, uh, we can kind of figure out that for the black hole at the center of the Milky Way, we'd have about 10 seconds before you know any of us were torn apart. Uh, since the Milky Way's black hole is 4 million times as massive as our sun, so it's got more mass creating a bigger event horizon, so it takes a little bit longer to you know get to the singularity. Now, I know this is all fun and scary, um, but black holes don't go around in space like eating stars, moons, and planets. Like Earth will not fall into a black hole because no black hole is close enough to the solar system for Earth to do that. So you guys are probably fine. Um, even if a black hole, the same mass as the sun, were to take the place of the sun, Earth still wouldn't fall in. The black hole would have the same gravity as the sun. Earth and the other planets would kind of orbit around this black hole like it does the sun now. And the sun will never turn into a black hole. So the sun's not a big enough star to make a black hole. But since we're in like the business of teaching here, uh, and you've all heard of black holes and maybe even already know all of that I just said. Uh, but did you know that there's a theory of the opposite of a black hole called a white hole? And these white holes are pretty kind of fringe science since they would be incredibly unstable, but they wouldn't be able to be entered from the outside. Although the energy matter, light, and information can escape from it. Uh, in this sense, it is the reverse of a black hole, which can be entered only from the outside and from which energy, matter, light, and information can't escape. But this is uh, more of a theoretical result of the Schwarzschild solution, and uh, which the solution is a useful approximation for describing kind of slowly rotating astronomical objects such as many stars and planets including earth and the sun which was found by Carl Schwarzschild in about 1916 and around the same time independently by Johannes Drost who published his much more complete and modern looking discussion only four months after Schwarzschild it's basically a solution to the Einstein field equations that describes a gravitational field outside of a spherical mass on the assumption that the electric charge of the mass, angular momentum of the mass, and universal cosmological constant are all zero. 
So all the bits around an object are just static and nothing. There's nothing pulling anything. There's it's just it's just existing with no momentum or electric charges or anything. So a Schwarzschild black hole or static black hole is a black hole that has neither an electric charge nor angular momentum and is described by the Schwarzschild metric and cannot really be distinguished from any other Schwarzschild black hole except by its mass because it's not there's no other characteristics to draw from it because it's not pulling things faster or there's no more momentum or less momentum. It's just this one's bigger than this one. It's not doing nothing. It's just sitting. Um, it's because the, the Schwarzschild black hole is kind of characterized by a surrounding spherical boundary called the event horizon, which is kind of situated at the radius often called the radius of a black hole or the Schwarzschild radius. Um, the boundary is not a physical surface, and a person who fell through the event horizon before being torn apart by tidal forces uh, would not notice any physical surface at that position. It's just like a mathematical surface, which is significant in determining the black hole's properties. Any non-rotating and non-charged mass that is smaller than its Schwarzschild radius forms a black hole. And since it has no charge or rotation, there's no gravitational waves affecting it. And because of that, it just stays there, just eternally, and thus it creates the term that we all use called the eternal black hole. Like, think if you have like a like a ball in empty space outside of the galaxy, not spinning around another object like the Earth and the Sun, not next to anything, and then this ball would also just suck everything in else around it that was smaller than it. Um, and everything around this ball we'll assume is smaller because it's just in empty space, so no planets or large masses within any gravitational distance. So it would just sit there forever because it's not being pushed around it's there's no gravity pulling it towards anything there's no there's nothing but so now this Schwarzschild metric was also the first wormhole solution which with the existence of both black and white holes it's assumed that a white hole would be inside of the black hole this means that the interior black hole region can contain a mix of particles that fell in, including another universe. And so a person who fell in from one universe might be able to see light that fell in from another one. And likewise, particles from the interior white hole region can escape into either universe. It gets obviously complicated with kind of four dimensions because that's when you have the white hole dimension kind of pushing light out into the black hole to fill its own thing. It's, you know, but simply put, it could be used like a wormhole that goes from one point in space to a previous moment in space time or pretty much like folding space time. And I'll touch on this later, but the reason you could go to a previous moment in space-time is mainly because it's it's mostly Earth's view of its time and space, the, the location that you're going to. So something was one light year away, and this wormhole traveled from this spot to the other spot one light year away, it would be an instant from one spot to the other spot. But since that other spot is one light year away, you would be one year in the past of what you were seeing previously. So you'd get there and it'd be one year in the future from what you previously saw. And then if you looked back at the earth, the earth would be one year in the past. So complicated, but we'll talk about that later. Um, 
So we're and we're going to take a kind of a short detour talk about dimensions just to give context. And it's kind of cool to learn about if you don't totally know the difference between, you know, 2D, 3D and 4D and its comparison to each other. So say we have a stack of paper and on this stack of paper, we can measure long ways, short ways and up ways. Let's just start like a normal standard three-dimensional object. And then if we take one sheet of paper out of our stack, that one sheet is basically a, a two-dimensional object where we can only go long ways and only short ways. And if you looked at it from the side, all you would see is a line. This is We're doing kind of very basic stuff. So I know it's still a three-dimensional object because you can still measure up ways, blah, 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 blah. But, you know, just roll with it. Um, so it's flat. So um, it's basically a, a slice of anything in three dimensions. So this sheet of paper is like a, a single slice of our stack. So a sphere turns into a circle because one slice of a sphere would be a circle, depending on, you know, where you slice the sphere at, it would be a smaller circle or a bigger circle at the center. So now this is where kind of perspective takes place. So humans as 3D objects looking at a 2D object, we can see every part of it, the boundaries of the object, the inside, the outside, everything. Like if you look at a piece of paper, you can see the entire piece of paper. However, if you were a 2D object on the same plane as the piece of paper and say the piece of paper has a circle drawn on it and a stick figure drawn on it, you can see the shape of the circle and the stick figure. But from the stick figure's perspective, that circle looks like a line because they're on the same plane of existence. So if that stick figure looks to the left where the circle is, he doesn't see the circle. He just sees the straight line uh, from the side of the circle. And to that same point, say we have a, a star inside of the circle. The stick figure still can't see the star because it's it just sees the outside border of the circle. But peep, the person as a three-dimensional object, because people are three-dimensional objects looking at this two-dimensional object can see the star inside the circle. And so this is like a 3D looking into a 2D. So we can see everything about this 2D object. We can see the inside, the outside, and everything. But our stick figure can only see the straight line, even though we can see that like a big circle and a cool star inside and all of these other things because we can have that other plane of existence of looking down at it. But so now if you were a two-dimensional object and you were to see a three-dimensional object, so say you would, you would still, you would be the stick figure and just on the piece of paper and then we have a sphere, just a three-dimensional sphere that we're going to show the two-dimensional stick figure. The only way this would work is we would pretty much be pushing this three-dimensional sphere through the paper on the same plane of existence as the stick figure, and he would see uh, a tiny little dot eventually get wider and wider and wider as the sphere passes one slice at a time through its same plane of existence until it hit the center of the sphere and then it would start getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until it was a dot and then gone because it would only see one slice of the sphere at a time basically making it into a 2d object and that brings us to the fourth dimension and if a uh, fourth dimension person was to bring a 4D object through our 3D space, 
like the sphere through the paper, it would shrink or expand its mass. So a 4D sphere being pulled through our dimension would increase or decrease in size. And more than that, objects would be able to be manipulated just like how people can manipulate a circle drawn on paper. You can make it bigger, smaller, you can see inside it, you can move it, rotate it, mirror it, everything. So and this fourth dimensional being moving 3D objects could do the same thing. It could just make the object bigger in mass for any reason. It can make it smaller in mass. It can rotate it, flip it, mirror it, all the things having to do with it. So 3D objects can manipulate 2D objects just like 4D objects can manipulate 3D objects and, you know, so on. So now that we've touched on dimensions, we go back to our wormhole. When we were folding space-time, it's the same as taking our blank piece of paper, going from one end of the paper to the other, and we'll assume that's a big distance. But if we fold the paper so both ends touch, and if the distance is relative, it goes from this long distance to instant. Like if every inch of this paper was one light year. So if we're taking, you know, this huge span of, you know, 11 light years and folding it into just right next to each other, not even a millimeter away, like a hundredth of a millimeter apart. And, you know, if if one inch is one light year, and if we shorten that one inch down to one millimeter we'd then be traveling at like 1 25th of the distance at the same time. But the distance is also relative. So it's, you know, now it's 11 inches. So like 11 light years still shrunk down to one millimeter. I mean, even way less than one millimeter. So it's, you'd be going 11 light years in an instant but that's just considering a wormhole as a 2D object. So if we bring it into a 3D object space like it would be, uh, we're crossing the same distance of that, you know, 11 light years. But instead of it being a flat line, now it's a cube of those papers. So that paper where one dot is on one end of the paper and one dot is on the other end of the paper and that's the distance that we're traveling, now we stack a thousand more pieces of paper on top of that one and we can travel from the bottom left corner of that paper to the top right corner of that cube of paper or anywhere in between because now we can go up and down. Uh, So then (laughs) if (laughs) on top of that, the worm, so we could travel about a thousand times more because of, it's now a 3D object. But since the wormhole isn't even a 3D object, it's a 4D object. So that stack of paper is now expanded in size by the same power of the difference between the sheet and the stack. So if we break it down, we start with, say, a, a one foot travel distance is one sheet of paper. And we can travel this one foot instantly since the paper for us will be folded no matter what form it's in. And then it takes a thousand sheets of paper to turn our sheet into a cube stack. So now you're traveling a thousand feet in that same second. And then when you turn it into the 40 object it, that it's, that it actually is, it's 1 million feet in that same second. And that's just a sheet of paper, not a supermassive black hole where, like we said before, the Milky Way's black hole is four million times the size of our sun. So, and traveling at that speed could essentially let you travel through time and space because the place you would go is so much further away that you would be seeing it in the past before you get there and time would speed up as you approached it. 
and uh, which I always kind of find it funny when people consider time travel in terms of traveling back 10 years or forward 10 years when so many factors come into play and you'd already be traveling so impossibly fast. You'd be going millions of years and more than that, it would be traveling through a space and time when we have our earth spinning, like, you know, people consider time travel or space travel, well, not so much space travel, but more traveling through time as I'm in, you know, sitting in my chair right now in 2021 and I go back 10 years, I'll be sitting in my chair again in 2011, 10 years prior. But the, you know, the earth is traveling through space. And so there's so many other factors that come into play it, because you, the earth is spinning at a thousand miles per hour and rotating around the sun. So in order for you to travel in time in any direction, you'd have to be standing still and jump on a moving train going 67,000 miles per hour while that train is also spinning at 1,000 miles per hour. <laughs> or you just end up in empty space until the Earth cycled back around, assuming you didn't miss the window by a nanosecond and end up inside the Earth's core. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Because the Earth is, is moving regardless of your position in space. So, you know, you show up on the opposite end of the orbit, and then you have to wait a year before the Earth came back to orbit and slammed into you. Uh, <laughs> there is, however, an alternative to time travel that is one of my most favorite aspects about space, and that's time dilation, which... Time dilation is like, consider a spaceship traveling from Earth to the nearest star system four light years away at 80% of the speed of light. To make the numbers easy, we'll say the ship is going full speed the second it takes off to the second it lands. We could also just assume the ship is already in motion at the beginning and we're just going until the point slows down to land, but it's... We're just going to do the same speed the whole way. Now, from the Earth's perspective, the Earth-based mission control, like center, assumes the journey went this way. The round trip, four light years there and four light years back, will take 10 years in Earth time. Everybody on Earth will be 10 years older when the ship returns. However, the amount of time as measured on the ship's clock and the aging of the travelers during the trip will be reduced by time dilation. In this case, because the distance from the Earth and gravitational forces, the travelers will have only aged like 0.6 times 10, so six years when they return. The traveler's final calculation about their aging is in like complete agreement with the calculations of the ones on Earth because the distance to time ratio. However, they each experience the trip differently through time. So no matter what method they use to predict the clock readings, everyone will agree about them. If twins are born on the day the ship leaves and only one goes on the journey while the other stays on Earth, they will meet again when the traveler is six years old and the stay-at-home twin is 10 years old. And this is specifically only in the case of speed through space. If you're ultimately stationary in orbit, similar to Earth, like in the International Space Station, the difference in aging would be non-existent. Seconds on your life. The thing that would not be negligible is the health effects. Because much of what you know, people know has either been learned while people were on the ISS, which is technically still within a part of the Earth's atmosphere, or measured after they've landed back on Earth, where the return to gravity has added changes on top of changes to their body. 
So there's the fact that the astronauts are required to be in excellent health to begin with. So they're not exactly representative of the general population. But in, in 2019, scientists published research that showed that astronaut Scott Kelly's telomeres were the caps of DNA that protect our chromosomes and shorten as we age on Earth. They actually grew longer while he was on a 340-day space mission compared to his grounded twin, Mark Kelly. So astronaut Scott Kelly's telomeres shortened to even shorter than they were expected to shorten to when he returned to Earth. But what if he were to stay in space forever? Would the telomeres continue to grow? You know, nobody knows. Or we, you know, no one knows yet. And although the possibility may sound like a positive, it's it's not like the fountain of youth. Because as you age, they get shorter. But if you go in space, they get longer. So it might be better, right? But, you know, people don't know if that's going to extend health span because longer telomeres are also associated with, like, an increased cancer risk. However, on the flip side of it, shorter telomeres are associated with heart disease and its own health issues. When these kind of DNA features grow, the cells have to keep dividing. And if you've got mutated cells because of the additional radiation exposure in space, you know, it's a bad mix. Not to mention cosmic radiation is probably the biggest worry for humans in space. To give context of how bad it can be, um, the ISS astronauts receive about 1,000 times the average yearly sea level dose of cosmic radiation. But once you head out further to Mars, it's estimated to shoot up about 500,000 times, which that in itself may end up speeding aging overall. This concern is why a group of biologists and geoscientists suggested that last year that underground lava tubes which are more like caves that could be many miles long, can be the most desirable kind of real estate on Mars. Setting up camp there would be our pretty much best defense and against all the radiation that you get if you lived on Mars. Wow. Telomeres, black holes, dimensions, so much to cover. Uh, so much covered. hope it wasn't hope it's not too wordy, you know, it just uh, seems you know, like a lot of information while going through it and everything, but it's all pretty connected and interesting. So we're going to, you know, take a short break so that we can thank the sponsor of the episode. And when we come back, we'll run through our solar system and learn some crazy facts about our planets. And number six will blow your fucking socks off. Uh, this episode is sponsored by BuzzFeed. No, just kidding. It's sponsored by ExpressVPN. Now, you might not be able to protect yourself from space radiation, but you can protect yourself from people snooping on your data. I personally use ExpressVPN on all of my devices, and it does so much for you. There's no reason not to use it. Like, you honestly should be using it on every device all the time. And the only time I ever don't use it is when I want a little bit extra speed if I'm playing a game online. But ExpressVPN basically creates a private tunnel that masks your information from places that record and sell your data. You can pick a server in your own state for faster internet or a server halfway across the world. The cool part is using a VPN like this unlocks the entire internet for you. People mostly use it, things like this for like Netflix when I think once upon a time the Harry Potter movies weren't on Netflix in the United States, but if you had ExpressVPN and it was on and set to UK, you could watch it because UK Netflix had it. 
and you can kind of switch to other countries to watch their specific shows as well. Uh, mainly, though, in a day and age where every website is selling every bit of data about you that it can find out to all these places, and then when those places get hacked, the hacker now more than likely has enough identifying information about you to crack your passwords and you know access your accounts. That's why everyone, you know, when places are hacked, it's like 20,000 accounts are compromised. But, you know, those and those places don't really care how secure your data is. They're making money on giving it out. And honestly, there's there's so many deals for ExpressVPN. I've tested out several other VPNs in my time, and every time I leave ExpressVPN, they give me a huge discount to come back. And every time I, I do inevitably come back, they have another huge discount going on anyways. And I just always do because it's just the fastest one I've ever used. And it works on every device. I can even I can even assign it to my router ahead of time on top of all of my internet. So I don't even have to connect to ExpressVPN on the devices itself. It connects to my router initially. So I'm already, I'm just connecting to an ExpressVPN connection through my normal internet, which is so helpful. There's a link in the description of this episode that gives you a month for free. And it also gives me a month for free. So it's, I know during Cyber Monday and Black Friday, they have all these deals going on for it. And it's, it's just totally worth it just to, for your own data to be safe. And it lets you do so many other things with your internet and unlocks a lot more potential of just your devices. And I, I mean, I'd cover the prices of of it, but it's, it's so all over the place with so many deals that they have that I could tell you it's, I mean, the most expensive that it would be is $13 a month, but you can, I mean, get it down to like $6 a month. It, so it, the range is so big with the different deals that they offer all the time. And that includes like months for free and like Black Friday deals and just searching anything, like any deals for ExpressVPN. They always have something going on. It's it's always worth it. And even if it was $20 a month, I would still pay it. And I have for other services that were worse. So it's it's just easy to use. It's so worth it. I, I can't express enough how important it is to keep your data safe. And they even offer browser extensions. So if you don't want your normal internet, just like in a game, to be like over this protected network and you just want it as fast as possible, but when you browse the internet, you want that to be protected, you can just install an ExpressVPN browser extension and just your browser internet traffic will be secured by ExpressVPN. It's so good. I can't, like, it's so good. It's totally worth it. The link is in the description of the episode. Get a month for free. See how it works. Your internet, I doubt, would be any slower than it currently is. It's incredibly fast. I don't notice any hang time with it with that I notice with other VPN services. So it's just try it for a month. It's so worth it. And we're back. We've actually covered more ground than I thought we would in a shorter amount of time. So, I mean, it's still not too bad because it's, I'm still going to be using quite a bit of time that I have of the three hours, but, you know, we've already made it to what, how long have we been running? I don't know, probably like 50 minutes or so. Oof. Only 50 minutes? Look, you're the one that wanted to research this last minute. Okay, well, we're still back with Pluto, who is going to go over the solar system. Yeah, so I've mainly covered, you know, space anomalies up to this point, really. So we're going to minimize the scope down a bit to just our solar system. 
and I'm going to cover just a few interesting things you may or may not know about kind of the things and the planets in our solar system. The first on the list is our sun. Uh, the sun accounts for 99.86% of the mass in our solar system with a mass around 330,000 times that of Earth. So of all the mass built up of all of the things in all our solar system, the sun is just about 99.9% of it. <laughs> so uh, the sun is so large, in fact, that about 1.3 million Earths could fit inside of it if you kind of squashed them all in, if like all the mass of the Earth was kind of mushed together. Uh, or if the Earth retained all their spherical shapes and were just stacked on top of each other and next to each other, then only 960,000 would fit. And also, did you know that the sun is made up of mostly hydrogen? Three quarters worth is actually hydrogen, with the rest of its mass kind of attributed to helium with some other sprinkles of stuff in. It's like 75%. 23% and then like little tiny 0.05% of little bits. Um, but the, an interesting thing about the sun is that you can take a picture of just the sun's matter, not the fiery bits around, you know, the outside. But if we just look at the surface or the fourth of the nine layers of the sun called the photosphere, it's almost a perfect sphere. Like if I held the picture of the photosphere of the sun up next to a picture of like a clip art of a sphere, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference just because it's so perfectly spherical. Uh, the sun's core fuses about 600 million tons of hydrogen into helium every second, converting, you know, 4 million tons of matter into energy every second as a result. This energy, which can take between 10,000 and 170,000 years to escape the core, uh, is kind of the conclusion of this energy results in a molten core of plasma at a whopping 9,900 degrees Fahrenheit. And when hydrogen fusion in its core has diminished to the point at which the sun is no longer in hydrostatic equilibrium, its core will undergo a marked increase in density and temperature while its outer layers expand, eventually transforming the sun into a red giant. And it's calculated that the sun will become sufficiently large enough to engulf the current orbits of Mercury and Venus it would basically render Earth uninhabitable because it would just be too hot. But not for about 5 billion years. So <laughs> after this, it will shed its outer layers and become a dense type of cooling star known as a white dwarf and kind of no longer produce energy by fusion but still glow and give off heat from its previous fusion. And as you can imagine, with humans being as simple as they are, they base so many things on the sun. Gods and deities from basically every civilization, time, and personally I find this interesting, but calendars. And you might not know this, but currently there are at least 35 different recognized calendars in use today all around the world, whose current year range from 3 to 1,640,995,199. And most, if not all of these, are based on the synodic rotation of Earth and its orbit around the sun. The predominant calendar in use today of those 35 plus is the Gregorian calendar, which is based on the 16th century interpretation that the sun's observed movement, where we have the sun rising and the sun setting, 
the Gregorian calendar was mainly just a minor update to the Julian calendar and was adopted initially by the Catholic countries of Europe and all of the countries they own. They mainly wanted the change because of Easter, of all things. Then over to, you know, the next three centuries, the Protestant and Eastern Orthodox countries also moved to what they called the improved calendar, and finally Greece being the last European country to adopt the calendar in 1923. And the only reason that they did that was just for, like, administrative purposes, which is about 100 years ago. But, like, considering it's, like, calendar it doesn't seem that long ago <laughs> it's just funny to me that all the dates of everything we you know do and days of the week people work and how all the bills are due and ways people get paid can be offset by catholics being irritated about the timing of easter it just seems arbitrary to me but let's move on to mercury I'm stuck down a calendar rabbit hole. So, so Mercury, the first planet, closest to the sun, smallest planet, technically. We all know this, though. But did you know that Mercury has a huge iron core, which helps it be the second most dense planet after Earth? And even though it's closest to the sun, it has ice. Also, even though it's close to the sun, it's not even the hottest planet. It's named for the Roman god Mercury, the messenger of the gods, most likely related to the orbiting speed of the planet, which is so fast that early civilizations thought that it was actually two different planets. Not only that, but it's also gravitationally locked to the sun, making you know, one day on Mercury, 176 Earth days. The last cool thing about Mercury is that because the gravity is so low there, everything in the atmosphere, clouds and beyond, uh, get blown away by solar winds. But those same solar winds bring in a whole new atmosphere, which seems crazy if all the clouds, satellites, everything in Earth's atmosphere was just wiped out and replaced by new micrometeors from solar winds to every single time. But this replacement on Mercury makes the temperatures fluctuate so much, giving it the ice and making it only the second hottest planet because of the fluctuations in temperature. So after Mercury, we have Venus, which is the hottest planet in our solar system and actually the third brightest object in our solar system after the sun and moon. Uh, the surface of Venus is actually hidden by a layer of clouds made up of sulfuric acid, and it's the second largest terrestrial planet, meaning planet with, like, ground and rocks and stuff. It also is such a low rotation that it takes 243 Earth days to complete one day on Venus. Not only is the rotation extremely slow, but it actually rotates in the opposite direction of almost all the other planets. And with space and everything like that, uh, pressure is always so cool to me, and Venus certainly makes a good case for having a very unique atmosphere outside of the clouds and sulfuric acid part. Uh, the pressure is actually so high, it's 92 times stronger than Earth's, and the equivalent of being like 620 miles under the ocean. So the surface of Venus is near perfect, because any asteroids that would hit it are crushed into dust before they even make contact. And this perfect surface mixed with the brightness of the planet is likely the reason it it got its name from Venus, the Roman goddess of beauty and love, and is the only planet actually named after a female figure. Which, funnily enough, brings us to Mother Earth, <laughs> which, is, 
which is actually not named after a god or goddess, and is said named after Eartha, meaning simply dirt. Even though the name isn't interesting, some actually interesting things about Earth is it's actually the most dense planet in our solar system. We have this cool built-in shield thanks to the nickel iron core, quick rotation, ozone layer, and magnetic field, which together help repel solar winds and absorb the sun's radiation, which makes it a pretty habitable place to live, despite 70% of it being covered by non-consumable water. Speaking of the oceans, though, a long time ago, all of the water on Earth was actually trapped under the surface and were only brought to the surface from the volcanic activity. Most of our other planet comparisons are compared to Earth, so it's hard to showcase cool facts about Earth that isn't just stuff you already know. (laughs) But, you know, I bet you didn't know that the Earth has more trees on it than we have stars in the Milky Way. About 3 trillion to 400 billion. And you do have a moon suffering the same fate as oranges in their naming, since we simply named it the moon. (laughs) And even with all the rotations and spinning stuff out in space, you know, we never actually get a view of the other side of the moon because it's tidally locked to Earth, much like Mercury's gravitational lock to the sun. So the side of the man on the moon that people always see is the only side people ever see. And the other side looks totally different and is covered in craters because that side is like a mini shield and takes all the asteroid hits that would go to Earth that aren't burning up in Earth's atmosphere. We now move on to the last of our terrestrial planets, Mars, the red planet. And I'm sure it's just because of its color and that that it was named after the Roman god of war because people were simple and war, red, etc. You know, the surface of Mars is actually pretty similar to Earth with about 70% of its surface also covered in water. And the gravity is at least somewhat similar. It's like 37%, so you could jump three times higher on Mars. It's the next most hospitable planet in the solar system, despite having some of its own issues, like giant dust storms, etc. But since it is the next most hospitable and probably because it's next door to Earth, it's believed to house Martians, which is kind of, I don't know, it would be a bit convenient with the massive amounts of planets that do exist for it to be Mars. It just seems like a theory out of convenience. The most interesting thing about Mars that I think, though, is... You know how sunsets on Earth are many shades of reds and yellows where you have like pinks and very vibrant colors like that? Well, Mars has the same thing, except instead of reds, because it's a little bit further away from the sun, it's actually blues, which is ironic for it being the red planet. But it's think of all the shades of red and pink and yellows that you see in the sky at sunsets on earth it's like you see those same diverse shades of blue on mars during their sunsets scooting past mars we move on to jupiter our biggest planet technically it would take 11 earths side by side to make it from one end to the other And despite its massive size, its days are actually the shortest of all the planets because of how fast it rotates on its axis. Jupiter is kind of amazing, though. It wasn't far off from being a star itself. And 
on its own has at least 67 known moons. And as most of us see Jupiter as a big old planet, it's actually just a mix of gases and liquids swirling around. Like if you sent a spaceship there, it wouldn't have anywhere to land. So finding extraterrestrial life there would be quite a long shot since the rest of the atmosphere is so volatile on top of not having any land. However, one of its moons, Europa, is actually the next most hospitable place in our solar system with a vast ocean under its surface that could possibly support life. However, Jupiter is pretty far away from Earth, so <laughs> to easily test anything like that currently it would be tough. If you took a trip from the Sun to Mars, you'd have to multiply that by three to get from Earth to Jupiter. <laughs> so it's, it's a little bit further away. But outside of Europa, Jupiter has all the coolest moons in our solar system. There's Io, the most volcanic active body in our solar system. Then you have Ganymede, which is the largest moon in our solar system, even bigger than Mercury. And Callisto, which has so few craters, which indicates almost zero surface activity. Just very unique. And all these moons actually created a different anomaly with Jupiter that people didn't discover until 1979, which was a ring. Much like Saturn's rings, Jupiter itself has a ring, which is made up of meteorites that enter Jupiter's atmosphere and crash against its moons, turning the meteorite into dust. That And that meteorite dust over billions of years has formed into a thin ring around Jupiter. And of course, since we've covered this for every other planet, Jupiter was named after the Roman god of the sky, or Zeus, his Greek counterpart. And if you've listened to the Greek mythology series, you'll recognize some of the names of Jupiter's moons as notable people around Zeus, like Amalthea and Metis. And since everyone already knows about the big stormy spot on Jupiter, we'll move on to Saturn. So Saturn, named after the Roman god Saturn, whose Greek counterpart is Cronus, was Jupiter's slash Zeus's father, mainly because of how similar Saturn is to Jupiter. Now, with the help of modern technology, people have been able to discover many, the many, many moons of Saturn. But keeping with the theme, the brothers and sisters of Cronus were also the names given to several of the moons of Saturn. Now, they ran out of siblings before moons, so <laughs> you do have to... Some of the planets called, like, Gripe, which is was a giantess in Norse mythology. But the planet itself, Saturn, is actually the least dense planet in the solar system, even less than water, meaning it would float if it, you know, if there was an ocean big enough. And it's made up of mostly hydrogen, which the deeper you go into Saturn, the denser the hydrogen gets, eventually turning into a metallic with like a hot core. Now, Saturn has this kind of running water theme where lots of water, lots of ice, and most of the liquids present on Saturn are frozen like the frozen ammonia crystals in the atmosphere that make Saturn appear yellow. Saturn is known as a gas giant, much like Jupiter, but everyone kind of believes deep down that there's a rocky core somewhere. I'd start looking in the middle. Well, yeah. So now you can't talk about Saturn without talking about the rings. Everyone always thinks the rings are just like millions of asteroids or rocks floating around the planet when actually it's ice. 
billions of tiny ice particles with a sprinkle of space dust and a sprinkle of debris. But the fact that it's made up of ice is why it's so visible, because it's so reflective, whereas like Jupiter's ring is not comprised of ice and is not really visible. So as we travel further out in our solar system, we reach Uranus. The third gas giant named after Uranus in Roman mythology and Oranos from Greek mythology, which was Saturn slash Kronos's father and kind of wasn't discovered until 1781. And it was originally going to be named after King George III, but the scientific community didn't care for that too much and decided to roll with the mythology theme. Uranus is more considered an ice giant, and its rocky surface is covered by a thick layer of ice. This combined with its upper atmospheric layer of ammonia, like ice crystals, give it its blue-green color, because it's like a yellow mixed with ice and blue, so it kind of has this nice blue-greenish tint. Uh, it also is the coldest planet in the solar system with temperatures as low as negative 224 degrees Celsius. Much like its relative planets, Uranus also has rings, but its rings are made up of bits of moons that were shattered by high-speed collisions with planets. And luckily, one of the moons that weren't destroyed to make up the rings is its coolest moon, Miranda. And it is home to a very unique surface area with ice canyons and like ice terraces. It's like a big old ice mini world. So we've made it to Neptune, named after the Roman god of the sea. And Neptune is a planet full of storms. You have storms the size of Earth all over, different spots, storms everywhere, 1,200 miles per hour winds, faster than the speed of sound. Now, Neptune has been the furthest planet from the sun, even when I was considered a planet, since my rotation is elliptical, it was actually occasionally closer than Pluto sometimes. And this went back and forth for a while until 2006 when I was elevated from planet status to celestial dwarf, which I've seen Lord of the Rings and I know how much everyone loves the dwarves so I'm extremely honored. And now that we've reached the end of our solar system, I feel it's important to realize the vastness of the universe. So just think of Earth. Everything Earthicans know, endless mountains and valleys, all of the, you know, in all of the Earthican wet ball, will just go to the next closest object, the moon. You would have to, to get to the moon, you would have to go the distance of 30 Earths to get there. Then when we go out even further, just to Mars, is about 1,000 times further than that, or about 50 million kilometers. Now, if you were to, you know, come by Pluto, you know, whenever, uh, that 50 million becomes about 4 billion kilometers away. Now, if we get to the next closest planet outside of our solar system, that 4 billion becomes 40 trillion, or 4 light years. Then if we just extend that to the next closest galaxy, the Andromeda galaxy, just our closest neighbor, you know, that four light years becomes 2.5 million light years. And currently we estimate 
there to be about two trillion galaxies. So this combined with the roughly septillion stars, innumerable exoplanets, some of which made entirely of diamonds, planets of every color, football-shaped planets, and even random floating pockets of water reservoirs just floating through space. All all these and more make up the universe. You know, with the, the black holes, all of the fun bits and stuff you see in all of the galaxies and you know, anomalies crashing in on each other and everything like that. All of it. Which the edge is about 46.5 billion light years away in any direction from Earth. Now, this makes a very solid case for extraterrestrial life. But to make it an even better case, the way the light years are measured, like we talked about before, are, as simply put, as literal as the phrase itself. It's the amount of time in years that light can travel from one place to another. So if something is one light year away, we are seeing the image of that object or light that that object emits one year ago because it took one year for that light to travel to us. So anything that we see from Earth is actually us seeing it in the past. So... You know, so much into the past, in fact, that the first microorganisms on Earth or the earliest forms of life ever on Earth that formed about 4 billion years ago, if you were looking at the Earth from a planet that was 4.1 billion light years away, Earth would just look like a habitable planet that could sustain life with zero traces of life itself all while the planet you are currently on is 4.1 billion years older and that, you know, people on Earth see it as. The best example of this is done by Futurama, actually, when the Earth in the year 3000 goes to visit Omicron Percy I-8, the home of planet Lur. You know, they're watching a copyright-friendly Ally McBeal named Single Female Lawyer a show from like 2000 when the episode of Futurama was being made. And because Omicron Percy I-8 is 1,000 light years away from the Earth, they were watching the show that was in 2000. So it took 1,000 years for the show to get to them. So even if there was a fully developed civilization identical to Earth's, or even more advanced on a distant planet, even as close as 4 billion light years away, which if you remember, the edge of the ever-expanding universe is 46.5 billion light years away. That leaves about 90% of the universe. (laughs) Not to mention that was only when the first microorganisms appeared. People on Earth would only see a habitable planet being before that civilization's life ever even began. Wow. Thanks for being on the show, being on the episode. Yeah, no problem. I actually have to head out, uh, you know, if I want to make it back to, you know, my spot in the next couple billion years. Yep, I totally get it. But wow, we covered a whole bunch today. Uh a little bit of time travel, a little bit of space, a little bit of solar systems, black holes, all dimensions, all kinds of stuff. And it was not at all near as long as I thought it was going to be. <laughs> now it is getting to be about that sleepy time as, you know, it's about noon now and uh I work nights, so <laughs> it's uh, it's about that time. But I want to thank you for listening to this whole episode of uh, very in-depth information of gravitational forces in outer space. It was super fun to make. And uh, 
even if you know none of it registered you know it's initially my my goal since i'm just here doing some final recap uh initially my goal of the whole podcast in itself was just having like something that i know that i would i always need something to play in the background whenever i'm trying to sleep or anything and uh i just want something to play that i know can play for a long time enough to help me fall asleep and not be too like loud like a action movie or something and not have enough stimulation where it's like i'm interested and want to watch the whole thing and so i was hoping to cover just kind of boring enough stuff that i can i'm able to talk about for a long time that would help that because it's it's a service that i know that i need and uh a lot of times it helps with just having it be a podcast because of the like the the issue that i have with it is when it's a video because i'll I'll play like a movie or a TV show or something and uh, I'll want to watch it because it's a show and there's, you know, video with it where the, the podcast is just strictly audio and I, where I try to upload it, I, I try to add like just a, a black background or a very dark background to it. So if it is playing on something like YouTube, it would be like a, much softer video portion where it wouldn't be bright and explosions of a movie waking you up or, you know, anything like that. But it's, it's turned into me doing stuff that I enjoy doing, which is super fun. And, uh, I, I still hope that I, I have the same goal or same purpose that, you know, when I initially started making it and it still serves that same function because I don't really know. It's, it's, I can't listen to my own voice. So it drives me crazy despite having every character on the show me. Um, <laughs> but, uh, I do super enjoy it. It's very fun. And if you are, you know, thinking about doing a podcast yourself just from listening to other podcasts i highly encourage you to do it it's it's very fun it's very simple to get started uh, the, all you pretty much need is a, a picture a microphone and like a device like a computer or a phone it's it's very simple and the easiest way to start is to just start this even if it's bad just start recording and st- go from there it's uh every single bit of advice i saw was to just start recording and it's it's so true um but yeah other than that it's been it's very fun so far i i love making the artwork for each episode different um i spend so much time doing research for every episode to make sure everything's accurate. Even if it's not, I don't really know. (laughs) I, I try my best to make it accurate at least to at least give information that will be worth learning. And, uh, yeah, super fun. Um, and if you join me again next time, we're going to be talking about, uh, probably sleep or dreams or something relating to that. But our, our next guest is Jeff, the sleep paralysis demon. And we'll hopefully be able to shed some metaphorical light on some sleep information. I'm sure I'll get to the Greek mythology here really soon again. Uh, I just like to record all of those in one group and then kind of release them over time uh it's just easier for me to kind of story tell it that way instead of just like coming back to it over and over again but uh 
yeah, despite this not being a three hour recording, it was still a incredibly long session because I wasn't done researching before I started recording and then I needed to find other sounds and all the other stuff, you know, that goes into it, artwork and everything like that. But, uh, yeah, thank you for, if you've listened to all this, it's wild. I <laughs> don't know why. Um, <laughs> but if you, uh, remember the sponsor of the episode is ExpressVPN, totally worth it. Links in the uh, description of the episode on pretty much any where that you're watching this. And, uh, I've bought a couple domains for the podcast. You can go to majorguests.com or www.majorstuffpodcast.com. They both go to the same place currently. I haven't decided if I'm switching over to major guests or not. If I if I do a couple more and I really like it, I might, but we'll see. It, it makes it kind of limiting because I do really like doing the DC showcase episodes. Um, and I don't really want to do guests like that because it's just, it would be too hard for me to kind of separate talking about the story of it and having a guest to talk about the story. And, you know, it's complicated. And I'd rather just tell it initially, which wouldn't be terrible if I just did a DC Showcase thing. But I can do, I mean, I could do DC Showcase ones for, for like days just on every person or every hero and villain for that matter. Uh, it, you know, it's just, there's, there's so many and it, it's so easy to talk about. So that could just be its own thing eventually. And maybe if I make like, if I make 10 episodes of it, I'll make it its own thing. But other than that, if you want to support the podcast, uh, just uh, download the episodes. That's the that's the best way. That that's what helps me track the stats of the episodes and see what's you know what's more popular being listened to. It's it's weird because it's not. It does track listens, but it tracks downloads more for some reason. So if like you're in Spotify and you hit the plus or the you know the down arrow. Um, that totally helps me figure out, you know, what people like and what people listen to and what, what episodes aren't being listened to just kind of, you know, helps me out. But I hope you have a fantastic day. It's the, now the second day of Hanukkah. So that's always fun and happy Hanukkah. And, uh, yeah, hope you have a great day. If you do anything stupid today, make sure it's not too stupid and uh, do everything in moderation and, and probably drink more water. All right, I'm going to sleep. Good night.